Namaskar, Nilesh Oak. In this session, uh, actually, I would like to make it a short session. I would like to summarize the decisive dating of the Mahabharat War. Uh, this particular session is based on multiple requests, multiple requests from different individuals, where uh, the request was to see a summary uh, of my research work on the dating of Mahabharat War in a summary form where people could share this video with uh, whoever they would like to share. Please keep this in mind that since this is a summary, it does not include all the uh, evidence that is out there, but I will just show a summary so that um, people who feel excited to know more about it they can always refer to my additional videos refer to my books refer to my blogs all right so let's with that uh, let's begin let me start sharing here okay the specific request or rather request and i'm summarizing it was also uh, to put it in the form as to answer some of the questions why uh, specifically astronomy. Why did I not begin with some other discipline of science instead of astronomy and so on? Again, because this is a summary, it's going to be a very brief explanation. So let's begin the decisive dating of the Mahabharat War, uh, a conclusive study that takes us to 5561 BCE. Okay, now if you look at this very problem of the dating of Mahabharat uh, war, you may look at it in multiple different ways, depending on your background, some particular comparison, analogy, metaphor may appeal to you more than others. So I'm just giving a couple, you know, and you can think of 10 other ways, uh, something that uh, makes more sense to you. But think of as a optimization problem, okay? So the people, folks from engineering or operations research area can easily relate to this. We have got a 100,000 plus long document has got description, that is a Mahabharata text, has has descriptions of all kinds, okay? There is, a, there is a, well, let me show you the list, but before that, so this is a one way of looking at it. Uh, if you are familiar with, uh, say, uh, linear programming, okay, uh, just to, uh, say two-dimensional optimization, it doesn't have to be two-dimensional. It is easy to show two-dimensional. So think of you are trying to optimize something uh, in two dimension, x1 and x2, you have certain constraints, okay, and so beyond this feasible region, the solution simply cannot exist, does not exist. So the feasible region is determined based on constraints. Now, within that, you are trying to find a optimum solution, okay? So for example, depending on, uh, say, specific constraint, you may get these different solutions, but they are not optimum solutions. They are not the ultimate solutions. And in that sense, they are not the decisive solutions. So for example, just as a visually imagine, uh, your optimum exists in this direction where the arrow is shown, okay? Whereas your feasible region, or think of this as a feasible data points, feasible specific points, uh, solution points, not data points, okay? The feasible solutions in principle could be these uh, corner points. But if you want to look for the optimum solution, and the constraint on optimization is given by this arrow, like as far as possible in this direction of the arrow, then uh, as visually shown, this would be the solution. Okay, so think of this as an optimization problem. People may come up with different solutions, but they may not be the optimum solution. They may not be the correct solution. They may not be the best solution. They may not be the decisive solutions, okay? Uh, in simple language, for everyone, uh, for everyone to relate to this, 
Think of this as a jigsaw puzzle. Think of this as a crossword puzzle. And it may also help to think of this as a combination of a jigsaw and a crossword puzzle, okay? So you have to think in terms of uh, the visual, the dimensions, Okay, that's the jigsaw part. And you have to also think in terms of the meaning of the words, in terms of the interpretations, in terms of the consistency and putting them together. So think of this as a jigsaw and a crossword puzzle together. And that's exactly what Mahabharata text is. Mahabharata text goes on to say that it is a puzzle in a way. Okay, Grantam Granthi Tada Chakre Munir Gudam Kutuhalat. It is full of curiosities, full of mysteries, and it's full of twists. And with a Vasakrupa, one can uh, hope to find out what those curiosities are, find out the explanation for the mysteries, and find out, uh, actually, uh, untie those twists. Mm -hmm. Now, there are different dimensions to this Mahabharata. You know, the, when did it happen? This is what I'm going to talk about. But that is not the only issue. For example, uh, to solve any aspect of Mahabharata or any aspect of anything, this is a doubt clearing machine. This is a problem solving machine. You solve with a, you start with a tough problem to solve, and then you have to make use of your scientific acumen. You have to make use of your Tarka Shastra, okay, the logic, your ability to think, okay, and also Tantra Yukti, everything that is there, the cutting edge science and technology at your disposal, at your disposal. You may not have access to everything. And with that, you have to solve the problem. Okay. So this is that doubt clearing machine. And now we decide, now we have to decide, let's say, uh, okay, where do I begin? And that's where that question comes. You know, for example, why did I select uh, uh, the astronomy or astronomy evidence from the Mahabharata text? Why not something else? And uh, one of the simple answer. Again, remember, this is a summary. The goal is to be precise and to be accurate. And if that's the case, there is no other alternative but astronomy. Now, of course, you know, we may want to use astronomy because it's going to give us the precise and accurate answer. But it's not completely in our hands because in order to accomplish the task, we need to have access to the right data. Fortunately, in Mahabharat, we do find that data, but... You know, I would say no one knows that when somebody begins to work on the problem like this. And I did not know it either. But if you look at uh, the different uh, types of information that is available in the Mahabharata text, uh, I can list it, you know, in, in few categories like this, say genealogy. You know, there are descriptions in Mahabharata, this person was a son of this person and so on and so forth. And... Uh, for example, there is a mention of, uh, say, uh, Bruhadbal uh, and uh, Dirghayadnya. You know, they were the descendants of Bhagwan Ram from the Ramayana times, but they were contemporary to Mahabharata. And they fought from the Kaurava side and they were killed, you know, by, by Pandava side warriors. Okay. So now uh, we have uh, the genealogy, but it's never a complete genealogy. So yes, the information exists, but not sufficient and actually not at all uh, useful to decide the accurate or to arrive at the accurate dating of Mahabharata. Okay. Uh, now, again, uh, we will talk about uh, why only the Mahabharata text. Again, be, this being a summary, I'm not going to spend time. It's common sense. It's... Uh, now, what do I say? Uh, you are trying to determine the dating of Mahabharata. The single accurate, precise source that we have access to is the Mahabharata text. You are trying to decide when the Mahabharata what happened. You begin with the Mahabharata. That's a common sense. Now, some people, if they find this confusing, hmm, well, this lecture is not for you guys. Okay, you need to do a lot of other homework prerequisites before you come and listen to this lecture, okay? So you may stop it here, move on to something else first. The other subject area is like a geology, geophysics, geochemistry, hydrology, you know, the, the river science, you can say. Uh, the path of the rivers, the change in the path of the rivers, that's known as the morphodynamics of rivers, in terms of both the paths, but in terms of even the amount of water flowing through those rivers, okay? Now, 
This evidence is also phenomenal in the Mahabharata text, specifically take River Saraswati. There are hundreds plus uh, specific descriptions of River Saraswati, okay? And uh, they are actually very useful. But again, not to determine the precise and accurate date of the Mahabharata war. Oceanography. Now, what's the significance of oceanography? Well, it has to do with the flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka. And Mahabharata text tells us that it happened precisely 36 years after the Mahabharata war. So if the Mahabharata war year is X, you add 36 years to it, you get the predicted year for the uh, flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka. Why, I say, why did I say predicted? Because the X that we have determined is predicted in a way, or even if that's very solid, now we have to find out based on a predicted year for the flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka, do we find any oceanography evidence? So yes, oceanography evidence can be useful, but it can again only be approximate and it will not able to pro not be able to provide us the precise answer for the year of Mahabharata war. All right, climatology, again, extremely useful evidence. Because River Saraswati that we looked into the bullet number two, the hydrology evidence has actually become much smaller, you know, about 20,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. And then suddenly another something, another significant event happened about 15,000 years ago when River Satlaj Shatudri, which was part of River Saraswati, also left River Saraswati. I said also left River Saraswati because River Yamuna, which was part of River Saraswati for thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, River Yamuna separated from Saraswati sometime between 50,000 and 40,000 years ago and started meeting Ganga. But River Shatudri, Shatudru or Satlaj, which is also a very big river even now, it stopped feeding its water to River Saraswati 15,000 years ago. So this river Saraswati, which has already become smaller after Yamuna separated from river, Saraswa river Saraswati about 50 to 40,000 years ago, became even smaller after 15,000 15, years ago, okay? So the question now is, what is it that shows all this wonderful water in uh, river Saraswati at the time of Mahabharata war? We have some time period called Younger Dryas, you know, about, say, 11,000, about uh, 13,000 to 11,000 years ago. Okay, suddenly the temperatures around the world plunged down. And again, a lot of water was frozen into uh, the icebergs and glaciers and river waters went down. It is then interesting that the climatology evidence shows that there was a rejuvenation of a monsoon uh, and river waters went up sometime between 7000 BC to 4500 BCE along this northwest area of India. So yes, that evidence is useful, but again, it is not useful to determine the dating of the Mahabharata war because that's a geological phenomenon, climatological phenomenon, but even if we have a descriptions of that in the Mahabharata text in the context of River Saraswati, they are not decisive. I mean, these things can happen for different reasons. On the other hand, if we already know or if we can figure out the specific year, specific timing of the Mahabharata war, then we may be able to relate all of these pieces of evidence and see if it makes sense. Okay, and I'm going to show you, not in the summary, but actually they do make sense. What about genetics and physical anthropology? After all, Mahabharata war is one of the significant uh, event that humanity has seen in a uh, foreseeable past, I would say, okay? Foreseeable past, remember that, okay? But again, unless we have something to go after and look for evidence, this may not be possible. Okay. In fact, the genetic, and I'll briefly show you the genetics and physical anthropology evidence, the phys genetic evidence today, not physical anthropology. I have shared that elsewhere. 
it was not available until I actually figured out the specific year of the Mahabharata war. What about astronomy? Well, that's exactly what we are going to do. Uh, but what about archaeology? Well, everything else, including astronomy, by the way, genealogy, not so much, but geology, geophysics, geochemistry, hydrology, oceanography, climatology, genetics, physical anthropology, astronomy. This is all archaeology, guys. This is all archaeology. So archaeology is not truly an independent discipline per se, which is to say what is, I mean, some people in their extremely limited understanding think of finding pots and pans and dating them as archaeology. And yes, it is archaeology. Okay, it's called dirt archaeology. But what is archaeology? You know, it is the study of the past. And how do you study the past? You study the past with all kinds of uh, evidence, all different disciplines of science, such as what I have listed here and many that I have not listed. And then there is an epigraphy, you know. Again, some people, I don't understand why. So you have to really ask them that question. Leaving aside the Mahabharata text, it is beyond my imagination and it is actually beyond a common sense why somebody will just go and start looking at uh, thoughts of people, opinions of people in the past and what they wrote about what they possibly wrote about some grants or when certain temple was built. And you know what these guys have done? If the word Bharat comes, immediately they think it's Mahabharat. Well, it can be Mahabharat. It may not be Mahabharat. But there is evidence. I mean, again, epigraphy evidence. Is that useful? Yes, everything is useful. I mean, don't throw anything, okay? Uh, now, out of this list, we are going to go with astronomy for the reason I stated. Uh, it is the only discipline of science assuming the appropriate data exists and assuming we have an ability to test it with the science and technology at our disposal. It's the best bet. But something else. Now, before I do that, let's use that astronomy evidence. So if once we decide we are going to pursue astronomy, this is how it will work. Okay, so it's a tough problem to solve is when did the Mahabharata war happen? Okay, what is my conjecture? What is my theory? If I'm going to use the astronomy evidence from the Mahabharata text to determine the year of Mahabharata war, my statement or the statement of my theory would go something like this. Mahabharata text astronomy descriptions, astronomy descriptions from the Mahabharata text are of Mahabharata times. Now, this is something I want to test. That's why it's called conjecture. It's a guess. Sir, um, not sir, forgive me. Okay. Uh, Richard Feynman, a great uh, physicist, Nobel laureate. How would he say it? A very simple way of a science, beautifully described. You, you have a problem to solve it. You start with a guess by guessing a solution. This is the solution. Mahabharata text astronomy descriptions are of Mahabharata times. Astronomy descriptions of the Mahabharata are of Mahabharata times. That's my guess. Okay. And then what do you do? Richard Feynman would tell you that once you guess, immediately, immediately, if the guess is done in a scientific fashion, it's a universal statement, it's a generic statement, immediately it's going to lead to many predictions based on the constraints. So Mahabharata text, you look at Mahabharata text, you look at astronomy descriptions, and now you have to see if those descriptions match for a certain specific time frame, certain year, certain day, certain month, and so on. These are the predictions, okay? And so from the guess, you derive the predictions, and then you actually take those predictions and see if they match with the actual evidence, Okay, so the predictions here are coming from reading the Mahabharata text. And then we are going to use the astronomy data, calendars, mathematical calculations, astronomy simulations to see if all this description, just like solving a jigsaw puzzle, just like solving a crossword puzzle, lead you to a specific time period. And 
if you are lucky, lead you to a specific year. And if you are luckier, it lead you to a specific month. And if you are the luckiest, it leads you to a specific date for the year of Mahabharata war. Once you define, this is very important step to define the statement of your theory. Once you do that, naturally everything beautifully falls down from it. That doesn't mean we are, we are assured of a solution, but the other blanks that we need to fill in into this doubt clearing machine, they are just very obvious. So once the theory says astronomy descriptions of Mahabharata are of Mahabharata times, the evidence is very, very clear. It is astronomy descriptions of the Mahabharata text. They amounted to that 300 plus. Okay. Now, how that is what? That is just, those are just the data points. From that, you're going to derive their interpretations, their translations, their meaning in the context of astronomy and decide what are the predictions. What should we expect? What are these predictions? What are these descriptions telling us? And those are our predictions. Now, how are you going to come up with these descriptions and predictions from astronomy, evidence, astronomy descriptions of Mahabharata text? Ah, you're going to read the Mahabharata text. In terms of its analysis, interpretation, you will use the knowledge like such as Darshan Shastra, the Mimamsa, the analysis, the Nyaya Darshan Shastra, the, in terms of testing now, uh, or even in terms of interpretation, we need to know the astronomy science, okay, astronomy technology, and just the astronomy knowledge we need is both of the Mahabharata astronomy and therefore Indian astronomy. And because we are going to Analyze this data in our times, therefore, modern astronomy, knowledge of modern astronomy. And if you are going to use, say, uh, a astronomy simulation, you know, astronomy simulation, unless you have designed it yourself or some um, individual with a deep interest in Indian astronomy has done it, it won't have Indian names. Okay, the names of the stars in an uh, Indian text, the, they, the way they would be in a Mahabharata text. That's why you need to know both Indian astronomy, modern astronomy. So as soon as you decide, and if you do a good job in writing down the statement of your theory, everything else becomes very clear and smooth. The What is going to be the evidence? Oh, everything that is astronomy in the Mahabharata text. Okay, so just start reading. Define what, are, what is my astronomy and pick up those statements, write it down. Okay, separate them from the Mahabharata text. Extract them, Prathakkaran. Okay, that's what it is. And you know what the background knowledge is required. And of course, then you decide, how am I going to actually objectively test it? Mathematical formulation, that's how many great Mahabharata researchers did it over last 100, 200, 400 plus years. Okay. Uh, and... Now, in our times, we are lucky to have very sophisticated astronomy software, but also mathematical calculations, significant amount of uh, very precise data on their proper motions, on their latitudes, longitudes, right ascension, declination. This is a technical stuff in astronomy, so I'll just stop on that. But using the latest science and technology, you want to take these predictions, descriptions, or predictions made from the descriptions and see uh, how far they match and do they lead to a specific time period, a specific year, a specific month, a specific date. Now, somebody will, of course, ask why astronomy besides uh, the obvious answer that that is the only science that is capable in principle of giving you precise and accurate answer. Well, there is actually especially in the case of Mahabharata, but in general, but let's stick to Mahabharata, there is very good reason why to use astronomy. First thing, availability of crucial evidence, okay, in the Mahabharata text. What is crucial evidence? That's something that surprises you, that shocks you. You said, what is, what is it? Is this the prediction? My God, how is this going to be possible? Ah, something that we think next to impossible, and now the uh, latest science and technology, our calculations, our Tantra Yukti shows that actually it is possible. Or if we do an experiment and it surprises us, like the Rutherford's experiment, you know, uh, sending the uh, alpha, gamma, beta rays through the golden foil, 
then suddenly there can be a surprise and the surprise takes you on a different path. That's what we mean by crucial evidence, crucial experiments that changes the entire path, you know, that changes the entire path that makes the revolutions. So is there available availability of such crucial evidence? The answer is yes. Okay. In case of Mahabharata, that is true. Now, when it comes to astronomy, it is the most successful theory. Okay. Uh, and, uh, for theory, but also for applications in modern science. In fact, the entire modern science, uh, when we say modern science in the sense of Western Europe, what they will call modern science, and now we all agree to it, that started about 500 years ago. The entire development, okay, I would say majority of the development, 90% plus development of modern science came due to astronomy problems and solving one astronomy problem after another. That's why it's a very most successful theory of modern science is astronomy, bar none. Okay, Within the Indian context, and therefore the context of Mahabharat, it's also a well-developed discipline of Indian civilization. It, it has a very deep antiquity. It's extremely sophisticated in the Indian context, and it goes long before the Mahabharat. Okay, now how do I say it goes long before the Mahabharat? Because I am summarizing this for you, I'm saying this based on my 30 plus years of research, okay? Uh, but you can go and check it for yourself, okay? Surya Siddhanta, Arya Bhatiya, Mahabharat, Ramayan, Rugveda, Parashara Tantra, on and on. Now, interestingly, not or not and not surprisingly, the numerous existing efforts for dating of the Mahabharat using I mean, there are many other efforts, 130 plus, majority of them, 50% plus of them. Uh, the efforts were made using astronomy, not surprisingly. The predictions, okay, are object, the predictions based on astronomy descriptions of Mahabharata text are objectively testable, okay? And the science and technology exist. We can do mathematical calculations on a paper, on computers, we can do astronomy simulations and so on. Okay, now, as I said, the intrinsic ability to provide precise answer that comes from that astronomy that I said, again, it's not possible to do that, do a good justice to that in this short uh, summary that I want to make it. So I'll go, go on. The other great benefit not understood by many is the tamper proof nature of the experimental evidence with the astronomy. Okay, so yes, there is that there is a challenge sometime of how a particular Sanskrit verse may get interpreted and so on. But there are not like infinite interpretations. There may be uh, one or two or three or four finite interpretation, then it stops. But take any of that interpretation and now you try to test it with the astronomy evidence. Guess what? While a uh, archaeology evidence can be tampered with, archaeology in the sense of a dirt archaeology I'm referring to, or a epigraphic evidence uh, is tampered with, but also it biased by the person who is writing the epigraph. Or if you're looking at the genealogy, the people's names are missed, okay, and so on and so forth. And there can be issues with the sampling if you're doing uh, oceanography or other stuff. Not so with astronomy, because, you know, our ability to go out there and change the position of the nakshatras or change the positions of the planets, change their speeds, just not there. Okay, it's extremely tamper-proof experimental evidence. And the, the uh, beautiful thing is, like the 300 plus evidence that I used, is all unified and internal evidence to the Mahabharata text, okay? So it's coming from a single source in that sense. Okay, let me go fast now. The first Sanshay, now what is that Sanshay? That is that doubt, the doubt clearing machine. We need a doubt, okay? So related to the date of Mahabharata war, some basic common sense like a ground rules, yeah, stick to Mahabharata. You're trying to figure out the date of Mahabharata, stick to Mahabharata, or extract the evidence from the Mahabharata text, read it multiple times. What do we find? 300 plus pieces of astronomy evidence, 100 plus pieces of reverse Saraswati descriptions and descriptions of all kinds. And I'm not claiming guys that I have essentially identified or tested every single discipline that can fit into the multiple different disciplines of science. No, but I'm going to show you the list at the end. What I have found is impressive. 
Okay. And actually at the end of this, if somebody said, eh, I'm not convinced, you know what? You are right. It's not for you. Okay. There are people today who still think earth is not spherical. There are people today, today who think earth is not rotating around itself. There are people today who think sun is not at the center of our solar system. You know, the, one of the foundation of Hindu dharma is the freedom of thought, but also means freedom of choice. So no one is going to push this on you. But after looking at all this evidence, you still say, I'm not sure, then it's not for you. I mean, so you're right. <laughs> you are not sure. Okay. Uh, so that's understood. But let's look at how much we can just get out of this evidence. Okay. So idea is to try the try to solve the real problems. The first problem, and it was just a coincidence. Again, I'll not go into the description that I came across. Was this problem now well known? Okay, is the Arundhati Vasishta observation from the Bhishma Parva just before the war began? What is that problem? Vasudev is saying at the time of Mahabharat war. It is the star Arundhati that is walking ahead of uh, star Vasishta. Now, why is this such a big deal? Why is this a crucial evidence? Why is this a crucial description? And why this turned into, turned into a crucial scientific experiment? Because, just give me a second. Uh, I need to, I'm not sure why it keeps on ringing. Okay, hopefully. Uh, okay. Um, so why is this a crucial experiment? Because whereas Vasudev is saying at the time of Mahabharat war, it was the Arundhati that was walking ahead of Vasishta. If we start looking at, and that's what I mean by objective testing, if we start looking at Vasishta and Arundhati in the sky right now, Okay, those who in astronomy know it, if you are not, if you don't know it, you need to stop the video and start studying astronomy, guys, to get to these basics or take it with a Shraddha. So Vasishta right now is walking ahead of Arundhati. And if we use all the wonderful data of astronomy, both Indian and Western astronomy, and start going backwards, what do we find? We find that for last 6,500 years, it is the Vasishta that is walking ahead of Arundhati. Now remember, Vasudev is saying Arundhati is walking ahead of a sister at the time of Mahabharata war. That's what made this a crucial experiment. Now, how do I know 6,500 years, uh, last 6,500 years, um, Vasishta is walking ahead of Arundhati? It took me 15, one, five years to figure that out. Okay. So think of this again, that doubt clearing machine. Okay. We have those that triangle in the middle. We have a problem of Arundhati Vasishta. Why Arundhati was walking ahead of Vasishta? What was the Karya Karana Bhav? What was the mechanism by which it went ahead? And if it did go, if it did go ahead, what was the reason behind it? And also when did it was uh, walking ahead of Vasishta? So, long summary, uh, quick answer, quick, short answer is that we can show, science can show, astronomy can show, modern astronomy, ancient astronomy can show that Arundhati was walking ahead of Vasishta. As far as the past is concerned, only one time interval of about 5,000 years, between 11,000 and 5,000 BC, okay? And 5561 BC is the answer to the year of Mahabharata war. We'll see how we arrived at that, okay? So what it is showing is, and then another researcher 10 years after me uh, wanted to test what if I said was correct or not, Siddhartha Chabra. He looked at the latest data and said, actually, the interval is not from 11,091 BC to 4500 BC, but actually it's even shorter. It's a narrow 10,248 BC to 4636 BC. Wow. What does it mean? It simply means that the Mahabharata war did not happen any time in the last 6,500 years or any time after 4636 BC. So if you look at the broader uh, interval, that is what 
I determined in 2009. And in 2019, about 10 years after, Siddhartha Chabra uh, went on to test this exactly same claim of mine and verified it and actually came up with a much narrower region of about 5,000 years. Beautiful. Okay. Now, what is this? So what does that say? That says that Mahabharat war happened sometime before 4636 BC and sometime after 10,248 BC. But this is like one of the 300 plus pieces of evidence. Okay. Remember, we are solving a jigsaw puzzle. We are solving a crossword puzzle. Just solving one word or solving, um, putting one piece of uh, the jigsaw puzzle in the right place is not sufficient. Now, what is interesting is if we are on the right track, then what happens is that happens to you. I mean, those of you who have played with a jigsaw puzzle or crossword puzzle, once you start, once you get a couple of words, you start getting clues and uh, you can accelerate, you know, you can accelerate your pace of solving the jigsaw puzzle or a crossword puzzle, which is to say in a scientific language, a theory should be able to predict new problems. Uh, but of higher complexity. And if the theory is correct, if you are on the right path, then you, you start solving additional problems, additional solutions, okay, to the other pieces in a jigsaw puzzle or the other clues in a crossword puzzle. Well, that's exactly what happened. So now we have an interval. Now let's say let's decide the year or the first day of the war or something like this. Okay, now uh, in a tradition, in a Hindu tradition, Indian tradition, uh, everyone is, uh, everyone knows, at least those people who know, they know that the Mahabharat war happened during the lunar month of Margashirsha. Now, sometimes some there is confusion as to the first day of the war. Was it the Amavasya, like the, the day of Amavasya when the month of Margashirsha begins in the Amanta Rekani, or was it the day of Ekadashi? Okay, now that could be for different reasons. Again, in a short summary, I don't want to go into that. But let's look at just the month of Margashirsha. Okay, and of course, well, is it the Kartika Mavasya or is it the Margashirsha Shukla Ekadeshi? And guess what? Until I figured this out, no Mahabharata researcher had shown any evidence from the Mahabharata text itself that points to that first day of the Mahabharata war or the lunar month of Margashirsha. Guess what? If you look at, if you look through the 18 days of the Mahabharata war and look, look at the phases and positions of the moon. So phases meaning the crescent moon or a full moon or full moon like moon and so on. And position means a position of the moon given in the context of a nakshatra of the 27 nakshatra. We have got 30 plus evidence through the 18 days of the war that those are the numbers that are given here. But a visual picture, the picture is worth 1000 words. So this is how the picture will look like. There are no descriptions of the moon. Uh, for the first seven days of the war. Moon descriptions begin with the eighth day of the war, 8, 9, 10, 11. And very interestingly, somewhere around the 12th day of the war, or possibly even the 10th day of the war, somewhere there, okay? Uh, but definitely after the eighth day of the war, somewhere the descriptions of the full moon start appearing. And they just continue, and they even reach a crescendo around that 15th, 16th, 17th day of the war, around that full moon day. And they actually continue until the end of the war, that is 18th day, and even a day after. Very interesting. Okay. And something else. On specific days, the position of the moon, or a full moon-like moon, is also explained, described in the context of a specific nakshatra, like on the 12th day of the war, or on the 17th day of the war, or on the 16th day of the war, and so on, okay? And uh, that actually helps us uh, define that, yes, indeed, it was the month of Margashirsha, and the first day of the war was Kartika Mavasya. So Kartika Mausi has determined as the first day of the war, no ifs, no buts. Now, now that we know the first day of the war, now we can start looking at some additional problem. The additional problem, remember, okay? So now there was a problem related to Bhishma, duration of Bhishma on the bed of arrows. Again, uh, majority people for whatever reason, and you have to ask them why they were so lazy and careless 
to think that Bhishma was on the bed of arrows only for 58 days. Now, funny thing is, they say 58 days and they cannot even show Bhishma on the bed of arrows for 58 days. What a disaster. But let's get back to what Mahabharata text has to say. There is a decisive evidence with multiple. 3, 6, 23, 60, 100. At some point, you'll stop counting. That much super rich evidence tells you that Bhishma was on the bed of arrows for definitely more than 95 days. Okay, more than 95 days. And somebody say, what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal is this. See, right now, the month of Margashirsha occurs around the time of winter solstice. But now, Bhishma was on the bed of arrows waiting for the day of winter solstice for more than 95 days. And what does that mean? We have to take this Margashirsha, which is right now aligns with the winter solstice, and we have to take it all the way. It gets shifted so that it is far away from the point of winter solstice by more than 95 days. And that 95th day is only the 10th day of the war when Bhishma fell down. So 95 plus 10 days, so 105 days. And it still has to be Margashirsha. And now we also know the uh, Kartika Mahasya. Right. So as a first day, so that 105 days away from the point of winter solstice has to be Kartika Mavasya. At least it can be longer. OK, now when you start putting this together with your knowledge of astronomy, the precession of the Earth's axis, the shift of the lunar month with respect to seasons that happens approximately what by one month every 2000 years. Guess what? These are the calculations here. And. Uh, a quick summary of that is back of the envelope calculation is that based on the duration of Bhishma on the bed of arrows being more than 95 days, the beginning of the war and the occurrence of the war during the lunar month of Margashirsha and Bhishma waiting from the 10th day of the war for 95 plus days waiting for the winter solstice. The fact that today winter solstice occurs in about Margashirsha, but that time the Margashirsha has to be 105 days plus removed from the time of uh, the point of winter solstice. Simple summary is that Mah Mahabharat war happened sometime about 8,000 years ago. Okay. Now, does that match with what Arundhati Vasishta told us? Absolutely. Okay. Arun what did Arundhati Vasishta told us? Sometime after 10,000 BC and before 4636 BC. What is Bhishma Nirvana telling us? Sometime between 7000 BC and 4700 BC. And if you keep on refining it with the Margashirsha, the first half of Sharad, and so on and so forth, guess what? Tithi, Paksha, Rutu, Mas, everything that is available in the Mahabharata text, it gives you a very nice interval of about 1500 years, between 5000 BC to 6500 BC or so. That's where the actual Mahabharata war happened. But still, I have not answered, at least in this summary, how I arrived at 5561 BC. Guess what? The planetary evidence, okay? What are planets? Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Sun, Moon. These are Graha, the, you know, in the Indian astronomy, also Western astronomy. And now we also know Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, okay? Just because this is a summary, I'm not going to talk of Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, but... I would encourage you to watch my other videos to even see what Vasa knew as it related to these additional planets from our solar system. But what does the planetary evidence tells us? Actually, we don't need all planetary evidence. We have 50 plus planetary evidence, okay, related to these planets that I just described. But if you start looking at these descriptions, and that's how the evidence looks like, okay, and I'm going to take you to the next page and next page and different types of descriptions of the planets, like Vakri motion, retrograde motions, okay? Seven planets attacking the moon, seven planets going away from the sun, seven planets in the company of the sun, Akramya, okay? Akramya, descriptions of certain planets, Pidyate, descriptions of certain planets, certain planets giving Pida to Nakshatra Rohini, who? Sun and Moon giving Pida to Nakshatra Rohini on the first day of the war. Saturn giving Pida to Nakshatra Rohini. Jupiter giving Pida to Nakshatra Rohini after sunset on the 17th day of the war. The descriptions are so precise. These descriptions therefore give us the predictions. 
Can you show Jupiter giving Pida to Rohini on the 17th day of the war after sunset, exactly the same way Saturn was giving Pida to Rohini or exactly the same way Sun and Moon was giving Pida to Rohini on the first day of the war, okay? That's how we do the matching. That's what I mean by consistency. You can look at the various conjunctions, okay? Multiple planets seen together, eclipses, on and on, guys, okay? And phases and positions of the moon that we already looked at, but again, in the context of planetary evidence, it takes you to one single year, 5561 BC. Now, uh, this is a summary, guys, okay? I created a series called Shraddha and Pradnya, and I have to go for about 45 episodes. And each episode may be, I don't know, 30 minutes to an hour to possibly even 90 minutes to explain all this planetary evidence. So if you are interested, and many of you would be interested, I presume, then you should go to my YouTube channel, Nileshok, Look at the playlist, Shraddha and Pradnya, and go through the entire series. I'm just giving you some demonstrative uh, as to what these uh, particular episodes look like, what do they focus on, and so on. Let's look at something away from astronomy. So what did astronomy give us? It told us 5561 BC is the year of Mahabharata War. 16 October is the first day of the Mahabharata War. That is from a Julian calendar reference calendar perspective. Kartik Amavasya is the first day of the Mahabharata war. Next day is like Margashirsha Shukla Pratipadash, then Margashirsha Shukla Dvitiya, and so on. In 15 days, there will be a Margashirsha full moon, Purnima, and so on. Okay. So we have the timeline. Now let's look at some ad additional evidence from the Mahabharata text, but outside astronomy, genetics. Now, this evidence was not available in 2011 when I wrote my book, When Did the Mahabharata War Happen? That came in 2015. Now, those people who wrote this paper have nothing to do with the Mahabharata. I don't think even they are aware of Mahabharata. Okay. Uh, so, what happened in Mahabharata? Something very interesting to know. About, uh, if you look at the Mahabharata description, 18 Aukshahini uh, exclusive male warriors fought in this war for 18 days. And practically everyone, with just a very few exceptions, were all got killed by each other, you know, by each other, by different parties. So if you take that Aukshahini and look at the Mahabharata description, that amounts to about 4 million people, 4 million male, okay, men. Okay, they died in these 18 days. Now, if you look at the estimates for the world population of that time, they range from 5 to 20 million. For this exercise, I took 20 million as the total world population. And then another estimate, because you know we don't have any detailed information available, but you see how beautifully it matches with Mahabharata evidence. The population of area that fought in the Mahabharata war, I mean, everyone, who, the, the people did not come from all parts of the world. They came from... Uh, parts of the world that is India at the center and from uh, around surrounding India, you know, in all directions. Again, you can watch my other detailed videos. So I said, uh, okay, let's half of the population was affected related to the Mahabharata war. Now, if you take 10 million as half of that population, just by a simple common sense, about 50% of them males, 50% females. So male population is 5 million. Now it gets interesting. So remember, the Mahabharata estimate for the death of male population is 4 million. Now, the 5 million means, again, these are crude numbers, guys, okay? But out of 5 million, 4 million are gone in 18 days. What would that leave us with, okay? Now, remember, there are 5 million women approximately. Now, that will leave us with a population estimate for female to male ratio of 5 is to 1. 1 million men left in that area affected by Mahabharata war and 5 million women. That ratio is 5 is to 1. Now, why is this important? This is important to understand its implication and connecting the dots with the genetics paper that came out by Monica Carmen in 2015. On the absolute scale, the female to male ratio they showed is that there was a sudden genetic imbalance that occurred in the past. 
And absolute, on an absolute scale, the female to male variation in the genes, not in the population, was 16 is to 1. But if you look at not the absolute ratio in the X chromosomes variation to Y chromosomes variation, but at the relative like signal to noise ratio, which is to say what? Again, this will just digress the subject. But, you know, if you look at the female uh, gene combination, that's a two X chromosomes and male is an X and a Y. So if we just take a pair, a human pair, male and female, Essentially, we have got two X's in the female, one X in the man, and one Y in the male. So there are three X's and one Y. That's what we just got with one pair, a human pair, which means the baseline is what? Three is to one. So that's what I mean by, like, as such, the, the variation between female to male uh, genetic diversity, X chromosome to Y chromosome diversity is three is to one. Okay, the, that's the absolute scale. Now, if you take absolute scale that happened sometime in the past, and I'm going to tell you the timing in a minute, is 16 is to one. But on a relative scale, it is five is to one. Why? Because you have to take 16 and divide by three. Okay, so do the math. Okay, so this is about five is to one. Now, again, what's the beauty of it? This absolute scale 16 is to one, Okay, that happened here. That is this peak here. So look at this number 16 here. Now, that is absolute scale. Okay, FE, female diversity or male diversity. But remember, when such a significant event has not happened, what is a average thing going on here? Remember, it's going on around three. If you look at it somewhere here, three is to one. That's the basic X, three X chromosomes to one Y chromosomes in a, uh, typical or every male, um, every human pair, right? So if you take this 16 and divide by this noise of three or four, you get five is to one. That's the point. Now comes the interesting part. Now, where did this happen? And when did it happen? The answer is, where did it happen? It happened with the India as the epicenter. This is that green forest line, which is the first one to see the significant decline, okay, is the first one to go to the lowest. And I have hidden this graph, okay, for a reason, okay, not to confuse your brains too much, but you can read the original paper and listen to my other presentations where I have not hidden this. And this one is the last one to recover. India is the last one to recover in terms of bringing that genetic balance together. And one more interesting thing, when did that happen? It happened 7,500 years ago. This is that peak, guys, okay? These graphs are from that Monica Carmen paper. That's a beautiful genetic evidence corroborating, validating Mahabharata war happening in 5561 BC. Okay, now we can just go on and on. Okay, so genetic evidence, yes. Now, where do you want to go? And you can go on in whichever way you want. I'm going to quickly show you the uh, oceanography evidence uh, for Dwarka. Okay, that's a description here. Um, so, for example, like you can read the detail here, but I'm going to give you a highlighted version. Uh, so, sorry, this is for the genetics. And now I'm going to show you the quick version for the oceanography evidence. Oceanography evidence uh, in support of flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka in the year 5525 BCE comes from all over the world. How did I get 5525 BCE? Well, the year of Mahabharata war is 5561 BCE. Remember, the Krishna's Dwarka was flooded and destroyed exactly 36 years after the Mahabharata war. That's what Mahabharata text tells us. 5561 BC plus 36 gives you 5525 BC. He said, hmm, 5561 BC, I added 36. How did you get 5525 BC? Guys, the answer is simple. I'm not going to give it to you. You need to understand what it means by before common era and so on. If you're not ready, you're not ready for this video. You need to go back to Google, find out before common era, BC, BCE, and why 5561 BCE and 36 years after 5561 BC uh, leads to 5525 BC. So that's the year uh, for flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka. The oceanography evidence comes from all around the world. Okay, I don't know how many episodes 
I did in the YouTube on this, possibly about 16 episodes or so, but 30 plus distinct data points from all around the world. Okay, everyone is shouting 55, 25 BC. Every data point is shouting, shouting 55, 25 BC. Some places, multiple data points are shouting 55, 25 BC. That's the beauty of um, the empirical scientific evidence and the wisdom of Vyasadev in noting down these descriptions. Okay, this is just highlight of the kind of evidence that you're going to see. A uh, number of you would have already seen it, but then, you know, you already know it. Okay, uh, all right, and I'm going to stop here. But see, this search for exciting things, to know more about our history, to know more about our itihasa, to know more about Mahabharat, it will never end. So we have to basically decide what excites you. And we as an individual, not me, if you find something exciting about Mahabharat, you want to know about it, then you have to decide to do original research. And there are individuals like that, like Jivan Rab, you know, only 23 years old, and he has now uh, written a book, Yuganta. He extracted all the yuga-related references from Mahabharat. They amounted to 100 plus and has shown how the Kali Yuga began on the last day of the Mahabharat war and actually have shown how it began on the perfectly matches with 5561 BCE, perfectly matches with the last day of the Mahabharat war, 2nd November 5561 BC. But that's another story. My point is, just like he did for Yuganta, I have also done additional work on uh, about the whole life uh, time of Bhagwan Krishna, right from his birth to when he killed Kamsa, to when he, um, along with Arjun, uh, established Indraprastha after burning the Khandu forest, when he made Krishna first, uh, sorry, when he made Pandavas the first time, of course, the Mahabharata war we know, but also uh, the passing away of Krishna also occurred uh, with the flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka, therefore 5525 BCE and Bhagwan Krishna's timeline. Okay, born in 5633 BC, is passing away 5525 BC, 107, 180 years. And another lecture sometime I'll show you how beautiful, not just a uh, triangulation, not even a quadrangulation, but actually you can do a pentagulation of the evidence coming from all different streams. Okay, Mahabharata text, Harimamsha, Bhagavad Puran, um, what else? Uh, oh, the modern astronomy, and our one of the not so uh, ancient um, uh, Vaishnava Acharya, like uh, Madhvacharya, okay, of the Vaishnava Dvaita Sampradaya. And I don't know how he arrived at the uh, lifespan of Bhagwan Krishna, but he arrived at 107 years. And lo and behold, from a totally different perspective, uh, from the Mahabharata text, from Hari Vamsha, from Krishna, uh, sorry, from Bhagavad Puran, and the modern astronomy, it also takes us to 107 years. But that's for another time. Uh, besides this, so if you are interested, you know, there is another series that I started. Uh, I call it Doctrinal Shorts, uh, yeah, as you can see the name here. And here you can see uh, much additional evidence related to Mahabharat, but definitely evidence related to flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka in 5525 BC. Well, that's the good thing. What is a good thing? The good thing about having a sturdy uh, doubt clearing machine imagine that visually as a three-legged stool is that you can just, if you're on the right track, you got the right theory, you got the right technology, right scientific method, your intentions are clean, you have a Vasa Krupa, guess what? <laughs> the three-legged stool, you know, you can just keep on piling stuff on it and it never breaks. It practically never breaks. You know, you can just add in. So we just started with simply trying to figure out uh, when Arundhati uh, walked ahead of Vasishta and why and what was that exact time period. And just with that one thing, essentially we could explore 300 plus specific astronomy descriptions from the Mahabharata text. Not only that, we could put them beautifully 
like pieces of jigsaw puzzle or the clues of the crossword puzzle and they lead you to 5561 BC as the year of Mahabharata war, not just that. Using additional Mahabharata evidence, you could find evidence from genetics, you could find evidence from oceanography, or climatology, hydrology, on and on. In fact, I'm going to show you the list. The list is this much, this huge. You can connect this Mahabharata time of 5561 BC with the Ramayana times of 12,209 BC. You can connect this with the younger Dryas, what happened about 11,000 to 13,000 years ago. You can uh, connect with River Saraswati. Okay, it's drying up. Yamuna separating from River Saraswati, Shatru separating from River Saraswati, Yamuna, sorry, Shatru Saraswati drying up, but again getting rejuvenated due to the intensification of monsoon, sometime around 7000 BC, that lasted until 4500 BC, then again Saraswati completely dried out after immediately after 4500, 4500 BC, correct? Right? So all of these things comes together. Now, as I said, once this is done, now you can go, which I have shown, by the way, look at my other videos, uh, videos on my channel, Nele Show, videos on Satology, videos on Jaipur Dialogues, videos on Sangam Talks, and many other places. Now you can go to genealogies of kings and sages, not only from Mahabharata text, but even from Bhagavad Puran, even from Hari Vamsha, even from Ramayana, wherever you can access them, wherever they are available from other Puranas. And you can beautifully connect them with 5561 BC. There is more to talk, but again, this talk must have already become longer. So summary, Mahabharata war happened in 5561 BC. And another key event, so think of this 5561 BC based on the celestial evidence. Then a very beautiful corroborating evidence comes from terrestrial, that is the flooding and destruction of Krishna's Dwarka Krishna's, and Krishna's passing away in 5525 BC. All right, with that, we'll stop and I'll find out how long was this summary. <laughs> but that's the nature of Mahabharata, guys. You know, Mahabharata is 100,000 verses uh, plus long. Uh, I have studied this and explored this in a meticulous detail over the last 30 years. And by the way, what I have presented is just honestly speaking, it's just scratching on the surface. And therefore, I would encourage you to watch all my videos, uh, different series, okay, Dr. No Shorts, uh, Shraddhan Pradnya, that is on my channel, or on Satology. Now we have 100 plus videos, okay. Uh, they go into different subject, but everything is focused on antiquity of Indian civilization. And some of the key sheet anchors, such as Mahabharat, Ramayan, Rugveda, and some other specific uh, aitiasic event okay all right um, uh, please add your comments drop your comments tell me what you like what you did not like and uh, i'll try to incorporate those suggestions to the best of my ability in future videos namaskar